Good evening, everybody. This is James Tippins for Theology on Call, October the 4th, 2020. It seems like it's been a month since we met together, but it's only been one week, uh, actually two weeks. Uh, The last Sunday of each month, we are off and do not broadcast. Uh, But I think because I didn't teach last Wednesday um, and the Wednesday before, it seems just like I have just been out of the loop. But I want to Thank you all for your prayers continually for us and for others, and know that we are continuing to pray for you, and um, we're very pleased to continue to have the opportunity for fellowship, even if it is through these means and through these mediums, and uh, do continue to let us know how we can be there for you in prayer, and also the questions that you may have concerning life, the Bible, and the Christian faith. There's a lot of things. I use the term theology because it's just something that I enjoy using, but it's a lot more than just theology. Even And if, as you've noticed over the last few months, we've gotten a lot less theological discussions and a lot more life discussions as it relates to theology. So uh, please send your questions. We're happy to answer them if we're able. We have a lot of questions tonight. I have been inundated over the last two days and even this afternoon with questions. And so I just tell you to hold on to your horses. I hope we can get through them all. Don't let that discourage you from taking time out to interact on the chat, interact whether you're watching on Facebook, on um, other areas, on the website, on the church site, or here on, uh, or on YouTube, whatever means through which you are getting this broadcast, please feel free to interact. We would love to talk to you. Okay, let's get started. Let's look at our first question tonight, and it is this. Um, Is it ever in any shape or form, characteristic duty or the responsibility to in any way um, guilt or shame another human in any any at all circumstance ever. And so basically the question is this, are we ever supposed to, as Christians, shame one another, shame one another? Now, what, is it, what does it mean to be shamed? Um, well, shame comes sometimes in the context of guilt. So if we find ourselves in a place where we are, you know, we've done something wrong or we've been, you know, had an attitude or we've said something inappropriately or, or, or what have you, then of course there's going to come in a way sometimes some shame or some guilt in regard to that. And these things are just natural consequences. Uh, for example, like a child in, in school, sometimes you see like if a child has an accident in their, in their pants or something as a, as a fifth grader or <clears throat> I mean, a, a five-year-old, a kindergarten, <laughs> as a fifth grader, even even then, or as a as a senior, um, you know, there's some shame there. But the question is focusing more on: Should we, as Christians, come to the place where we should shame others? And as you see the text there, with excuse me, Ephesians chapter four, um, starting in verse seventeen through thirty-two, it says, "Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles." In the futility of their minds, they are darkened and in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. <clears throat> they have become callous. They have been given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, as Paul says. And that then says, assuming that you have heard about, heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth in love with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun get down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, 
as God in Christ forgave you. And I'll be honest with you, the question is answered there in Ephesians chapter 4. So I'll answer it quickly, and then I'll discuss it for a moment. There is never an opportunity that I, as a believer, we should purposefully try to shame um, in any way or bring guilt upon another another person, or especially another believer, another sibling in Christ. Uh, this is the way of the Lord. This is the way of those who are worthless in their mind and thinking, worthless in their speech, work, worthless in their actions. Uh, the church is not worthless. The believer is not worthless. He or she is important to the glory of God, important to the name of Christ, to the work of Christ. The believer is important to each other, to other believers. And if Paul would affirm the reality that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then why would there be condemnation for those, uh, you know, in a temporal sense? Now, of course, this doesn't mean that shame doesn't come. For example, when sin enters our lives and uh, to the place where it becomes public or that it becomes divisive, the word heresy, divided opinions, yes, sin it can also be heresy. Um, it's not always about doctrine. As a matter of fact, I've got that question tonight. Uh, so when we when we see things that happen in, in the lives of others, our own lives, our place is to restore that person, not to sh- shame them or guilt them. Um, we're never supposed to be in any way, in any manner, harsh with attitudes. We aren't supposed to bring bring shame upon people. We're not supposed to bring any kind of negative attention to people. And I know what people are thinking, well, what about false teachers? Well, what about false teachers? You know what we're supposed to do with false teachers? Have nothing else to do with them. So when we continually bring light and shame upon them, we're actually sinning before God because we're bringing attention to them and we're pointing people. That's like saying, don't look over there. Please, for the love of all things, don't look over there and pointing. People are going to hear that. They're going to look over there. If you share a sermon that's heresy, people are going to listen to it. They're going to be exposed to heresy. And you and I, if we do that, we are teaching people error on purpose. Um, and so that's, no, that's not the point of this, but I, think, I hear that rebuttal all the time. And, and I'll just say this. There ain't that much heresy amongst our siblings that we need to be about the business of hunting that stuff down. So that's a whole number of the conversation. We've had that question a couple of weeks, a couple of months back. But when it comes to, sh- to shame, uh, we should be ashamed to shame others. And restoration of the gospel says that Christ took on flesh and died in our place so that there is no shame. So if we're not going to be ashamed before our Father, why would we be ashamed before our brothers and sisters? Now, I know that our culture says something different. There is a sense, too, that public shame comes. What does Paul say in, in 1 Corinthians? That we are to turn the brother over to Satan, that he may be ashamed. Paul says the same thing in his writing to Timothy. Turn this brother out. Uh, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that he might be ashamed. Um, but what shames them? It is the public reality. It is the public exposure that this person refuses intimacy and refuses fellowship. This person is unwilling to be loving. That's the only thing that truly brings shame upon the shame upon the believer. And it's not we who bring that shame. It is the fact that when we separate from someone, that is shameful. It's sort of like a child uh, in a home. And that child is playing with the other children. And then that child does something or says something that's extremely sinful or wrong or divisive. Or uh, uh, it hurts the situation, hurts the playtime, hurts the relationships. And we take that child and we don't shame it. We don't say, you're a a piece of garbage and you're destroying everything good. And I can't believe that you even live on the earth. (laughs) Of course, we wouldn't say that. But if we just take that child by the hand and said, because of how you've acted, you're going to sit over here in the corner. The very nature of sitting in the corner brings shame. But that ends. We didn't cause that. The behavior caused that. The consequences caused that shame. But it's one, It's different than if the consequences of the behavior cause the shame versus we are the shamers. Uh, and then what's the point of the shame? To be restored to the intimacy, to be restored to the praise, to be restored to the, to the body, to be restored. So if the shame comes consequentially, then isn't the restoration, the removal of that shame? So we should be about the business of the removal of shame. Now, this this isn't a vacuum, brothers and sisters. This question is important, but I know and I have a feeling that it has to do with how we see other brothers treat other brothers online and in certain social circles and on social media. And and, and I'll be honest with you. uh, Some of the people, the way they act and speak and deal with others online need to be brought to correction. 
They don't need to be shamed. They need to be brought to correction. Because if we don't have love, we have no business even existing in the context of wearing the banner of Christ. If we don't have love and we're not known for the love of Christ, we ought to be quiet and to delete everything that we have in the world that exposes ourselves as Christ people if it's going to be hateful. So, And that just goes not only for the body of Christ, but to our neighbors and to our enemies about politics, about the economy, and everything else. We need to be known as, not pacifists, but we need, to know, we need to be known as loving people who are quiet and who are humble, which means that we would be seen as wise and seen as good stewards and seen as those who are controlled and compelled by the love of Christ rather than the love of our flesh. So there's a huge... There's a huge um, there's just a huge place that I could go here. I mean, we could we could go we could go on for hours and hours and hours. And it is it is important to have this conversation. And Sister Angelina, I see that you put uh, a question here. I'll stick it up on there. Uh, she says, "What about someone who slanders a brother?" Um, we can't admonish this person. We absolutely can. But the 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 point that we need to bring about in that is admonishment is a warning. But the warning is not to shame them. It's not to bring guilt upon them. In other words, for example, let's just say that I, I'm upset um, that Scott Price's uh, Facebook account got deleted, and I'm mad with him because he deleted all my wonderful conversations that I had with him over the years. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very upset that some of that interaction is gone, but the Lord is sovereign in it. Uh, and then I just started talking trash about him right now, just blah, 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 Brother Scott. Of course, I, I wouldn't do that, but what if I did? Um, what, what is, is it wrong for one of you to say, Brother, that was sinful. Uh, that was that was shameful. That was that was not loving. You need to you need to correct that. You have ruined your you have ruined your reputation. That's not bringing guilt or shame. Now, if I'm guilty or shameful because of that, that's the natural consequence of that sin. Absolutely, we are to admonish, but we can't make people see the difference in admonishing and speaking the truth in love. Sometimes, even if it seems harsh, you know what? That's wrong. This is wrong. That is right. This is not a thing. We need to we need to make clear that we we do that so that the correction is made, and that we, as I said a minute ago, and when there is a brother who doesn't listen, we we put it to bed. We're done with it. We are not God's. We are not God's ants to bring the to continually to bring the charges against people. When we've said it once, we've said it enough. That's the point that we need to make. And when we become when we become angry and evil in our speech, even with false teachers, we have to be we have to be we have to recognize that we are acting like unbelievers. We are we are putting on the expression of those who have absolute impurity. Because when I see a, a, a person who is teaching a lie about Christ, my first response is that I'm brokenhearted, and then I'm fearful for them. And then even if I have to say to all of you, you have to know this is true about the teaching of this person. It breaks my heart to have to do it, but I have to do it. But at no time should I carry it beyond that and then begin to call names and act hateful and be evil in my actions and words. So I hope that helps you understand. Being kind and loving um, it doesn't mean that we ignore the hard things that we have to do. So yes, like, like, like Brother Stephen says, pointing out a false teacher, we can do that, but we don't shame them. We don't continue to berate these people. Let the Lord handle them. Let the Lord handle them. Yes, Sister Carla, we all need to work on our love walk, and together we do that very well by the mercies of God. Superb question. Were there prophets during the apostles' time? What about Acts chapter 11? Oh, my goodness. That just went very small. What about Acts chapter 11, uh, verse 27? So, yeah, there were prophets during the Lord's time. But we have to understand what a prophet is. A prophet is the one that speaks for the Lord. So, in in the days of the apostles, um, we, we do see... That the scripture says there in verse 27, and now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of uh, Barnabas and Saul. So we are definitely, we definitely see in the scripture that there were prophets. Now, just because someone is a prophet 
and does speak for the Lord doesn't mean that they are one of the prophets of God. So I believe there were a, a circumstances where in the context of the Jewish faith that God spoke prophetically through people, but these things were tested. These things were these things, if they ever were ever wrong or ever delayed, this person was stoned in ancient Israel uh, for being a liar. <laughs> so to lie on God in the days of in the days of ancient Israel um, historically was to be dead. And so imagine if that were the case today. So there were prophets during the apostles' time. However, the prophets weren't in the office of prophet. They just did the work of prophets. Just like there is no longer anyone who is in the office as an apostle, though we may do apostolic-like work. And so prophecy now today is to speak the word of God. And God may, through the years of study of the Bible, God may actually give me the ability to remember some things and bring things to mind by the Spirit. He may help me cross-reference some things and have the synergy of, of knowing that the Bible teaches uh, congruently about certain things, considering the gospel and other things. And so I may be talking, and then all of a sudden I, I just sort of go, okay, yes, like there and there and there. But everything that I would do in the context of being prophetic would come from the pages of the text, even if I didn't particularly have the pages of the text with me. So the prophets that we have today are those who teach the scripture because we have the prophets and the apostles who were also prophets, you see. And so that, that's the answer to that question. Yes, they absolutely did. But that work was completed by the end of the apostolic ministry uh, in the way of someone just having a word and coming and telling it. <clears throat> Good question. Next question. How am I to respond to people who constantly inundate me with talk of end times and thinking that we need to get America on track before we all perish? Oh, I wish I could remember who, who sent this question in because I'd call you by name and I'd, 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 I'd tell you I have a kindred spirit. It is, one of the, it is one of the things that I hear most of the time, especially in today's um, economy, <laughs> uh, the economy of, of circumstance. We need to understand that America is not part of God's eternal kingdom, okay? There is no such thing as a country or a king who has any prominence or existence in, in the eternal kingdom of heaven. The Bible teaches that all nations, in the context of their, of their ontological, uh, uh, of their existence, all kings, all nations are for one purpose, to go, no, go, go away. They're to go away. Um, John the Baptist says it best, I must decrease and he must increase. So in this, we, we, we have to get focused on what it is that God's called the church to do. We need to understand that end times began at the death of Jesus. We see that, we see that in the narrative of the apostles. They called that time, the last days. Jesus called his time on earth the last days because it is now done. The fulfillment of redemption is, is finished. Jesus Christ has saved his people from their sins. His death has propitiated for them. They are, they are as good as glorified because Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave. This is nothing to do with America. Now, are there consequential things that take place in the context of God's judgment? And are, are there temporal blessings? I have another question that I hope we get to today that has to deal with, the you know, is God in the business of judging things now? What does it look like, etc.? A lot of times these things can become very philosophical, so I want to be careful to stay to the task that I'm called to, which is to try to show you in the Word what is said and the answers to these questions as it relates to what is written rather than what I think or believe or assume. But in this, how do you respond? Here's how you respond. You press the gospel of free and sovereign grace. You continue to push the person of Christ. You take that conversation and you say, well, that might be the case, but let me tell you something right now. This is what the Bible teaches us as God's people we should be about. We should not be looking into the sky. We should not be worrying about preparation of a nation. We should be, we should be concerned the fact that we are prepared in the death of Christ to receive glory and to be glorified and to stand in the presence of God our Father with no condemnation. So we have nothing to fear. End times is the packing of the bag to go on the eternal vacation trip of glorification. End times is nothing to fear. There is nothing in the Bible that causes any believer to ever shudder in their boots or worry in their hearts or speak ill in their mouths. We ought to be very careful. 
how we answer people in this. And I believe the best answer is to get to the gospel and to ignore the, ignore the issue of end times and Americanism and nationalism and, 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 re, and national repentance. There's no such thing as national salvation. There is no such thing. So that's a whole other question that we could talk about too. God be praised to the proclamation of his, of his son. In Matthew 28, Jesus speaks of the Great Commission. How do we make disciples when God is sovereign in the election of his people? This is an awesome question. My brother in Virginia sent this question in. And, and the answer is, is, is very easy. Um, we see that God is sovereign. I had to take a breath there. We see that God is sovereign. We know that God elects his people. We know that God has saved all those he has foreknown in the death of Jesus Christ, and he will grant them faith as he sees fit, when he sees fit, at the proclamation of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection for the elect. This is important to understand that the gospel as it is presented is really proclaimed as a finished work for the people of God alone. It's not universal. It's not a free offer. It's not well-meant opportunity. It is strictly the good news is strictly that God has put away his wrath for his people because he killed his son instead and that he's promised eternal life and because of that we now have more we are more than conquerors and we live because Christ lived lives and he is our life so in Matthew 28 Jesus and even in the other synoptics Jesus gives this instruction. I don't like calling it the Great Commission because it's a silly notion that came to the headings of certain things. This is not evangelism. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking to the church to go into all the nations and teach the body, the elect of God, the truth about Christ, every jot and tittle. Teach the gospel. You want to share the gospel? You need to get very familiar with the gospel of John from start to finish. Every chapter, understand the, the simple implications of the theological teaching that comes through the narrative and just hit home the key points of what God has done through Jesus Christ to satisfy his wrath for his people and that he has redeemed his people. He has given his people to the Son and the Son got on the cross and it is finished. And Matthew 28 is about we, the body of Christ, continuing to teach those who claim to be in Christ the fullness of the New Testament, the fullness of the Bible, the reality of the, of the New Testament epistles that teach us the therefores. Now, because you have seen the love of God, because as I was preached this morning, you are the children of God because of his great love. Uh, this is what I want from you. Out of, out of your gratitude, out of your hope, and out of your love for the Lord Jesus, if you want to love him, the only way possible in the cosmos that you can love Jesus is to love each other. And Jesus is commissioning or sending these disciples to go out into the world and to continue to teach the Bible as we know it, the Scripture, the New Testament, the teaching of Christ, and to go and discipleship or be disciplined about the discipline of teaching people the discipline of knowing the truth of the gospel. And I've been using that term a lot over the last few weeks because we're really pressing the issue of what it means to be disciplined. Um, I'm a shooter, I'm a chess player, I'm a, a musician, I also have been a, a boulderer and a rock climber, and I've done a lot of interesting little things through the years, um, and, I, and I do martial arts. I have to be disciplined. I have to stay on these things. I have to have someone who's better than me who can come along and say, this is the wrong way, slide over this way. This is the wrong way, hold it this way. This is the wrong way. Make sure you don't slip here, you're going to fall to your death. That's 100 feet. You know, do this and be disciplined. The same thing with speech. It's not easy to speak clearly and articulately living in the South. We got a real bad habit of really going fast and then talk about this one nobody knows what we're going to talk about. But that's all right. We get it on there. We get on time and we'll, we'll find out how to work. You know, and that's, <laughs> you know, well, you could, I can speak like that very easily. So, but it takes discipline to become articulate. It takes discipline to, to learn how to tie a bow tie. We do it over and over again. It takes discipline to learn the truth and to apply the truth into the life of the believer collectively as the body of Christ, the assembled when we gather together. We need to recognize that because of God's sovereign election, he is going to teach his people. And that's what the Great Commission is all about. And when we go into other places and we instruct other people, I never not take a question about the Bible. I never, ever 
just try to press into a conversation very quickly to get to the bottom of it. If someone tells me they're a believer, I'm going to know in just a quick minute because I'm going to open up the Bible and I'm teaching something true. And if they reject that truth in the Bible, I know that they haven't been taught of God in the context of what the Scripture teaches concerning Christ. And then I'm going to continue to teach them. And if they'll sit there, I will make disciple of that person until the cows come home or until God sends them in a different direction. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. The Great Commission is not about seeing people come to faith. The Great Commission is about the elect of God coming to the knowledge of the truth and growing in it. So there's that. Next question. Can you speak to how I can deal with stress in my life? Absolutely not. Drink mild coffee. Uh, (laughs) Stress um, is not going away. Let me just say that. Stress is not going away, beloved. And the next question is about depression and anxiety. Next two questions. Um, It's not going anywhere. Stress is a natural part of life. Stress is a natural part of what we are supposed to deal with as human beings. Um, if we're looking for a stress-free life, we're, we're running a fool's errand. We're actually in a fairy tale land. It doesn't exist. The question is, how do we deal with stress? How are we going to have an opportunity to come to the place of seeing that which causes us stress? And what is it? It's different for most people. Uh, I mean, for all people, it's different. I mean, what causes me stress would not cause most of you stress. And for what causes you stress doesn't cause me stress. Um, I'm stressed out about the probabilities of things. Uh, I get stressed out about the unpreparedness of things. Um, You know, I I just, I, I did radio for years and years and years and years. And, you know, it's, it's not a big deal to be under the pressure of radio. It's not a big deal for me to talk for an hour straight like this on a video camera live. I'm not sitting here and being quiet and letting dead air. We call that dead. It's not stressful. But if I sent some of you to sit in a chair like this and said, okay, you know, there's a bunch of people watching. Now I want you to answer this question. And I don't want you to stop talking because I want you to inform people no matter what happens. It would stress you out. Some people get stressed out driving in certain type of traffic. Some people love driving in big cities. Uh, I've been both ways. I prefer not to drive in big cities, but I can. Um, so what does stress us out? Well, coronavirus can stress us out. Being a f- away from our family can stress us out. Worrying about money can stress us out. But what's the root of stress? Our humanity our humanity and everything in it, we, we are never going to get away from it. So now how do we deal with it? The Bible teaches us to pray and to supplicate for one another. So not only we should pray, we should be honest. I'm scared to death about my finances, <laughs> Brother Bill. Uh, I'm scared to death about, about my health. I'm scared to death about my marriage. I'm stressed out about my job. I'm stressed out about this. And this all goes together. I'm answering the next few questions all at once. So the next question is, can you discuss depression and remedies? And this one, and anxiety. So I'm gonna. it's all going to fit together. And these next two questions are going to go hand in hand. So how do we deal with it? Then what is the true point of stress, anxiety, depression, and fear? It is the unknown and the uncontrollable. If I really had to get to the bottom of it, I think psychologically and emotionally, it comes from that. What am I going to do? I can't do anything about this. So what am I going to do? Uh, and, and you see the absurdity in that? I mean, and that's, that's what I do. I mean, what, I hear a storm's coming and I, f- I freak out. I've got to take everything and do everything I can't even pack up for a storm um, without being stressed out over how I'm going to pack it or how it's going to be unpacked <coughs> or how long is it going to be in, in storage if I, if they, or if a tree blows over here, if a tree blows over there. And my wife calls it this way, you're borrowing trouble. <laughs> you're literally, <coughs> excuse me, you're literally borrowing trouble. We, are, uh, are, we have to look then at that which is immovable, at that which is imperishable at that which is it, it, it's not going to change. If everything that changes and the uncertainties of life is what stresses us out, then wouldn't it be better to focus on that which is unchangeable? Well, what's unchangeable? <coughs> Excuse me, Jesus Christ and his gospel. The unsurpassing power of God, the love of God, it doesn't change. And so if we understand the gospel is our remedy, then we can go to the gospel. And beloved, it is the best thing for us to do when each other comes to one another and says, hey, I need some counsel. I mean, are we going to counsel people therapeutically to not be stressed out? How do we do that? I mean, I I have a little stress ball on um, on my desk. And I use it. My wife had it, and she threw it at me a couple of weeks ago. And I've been using it because it helps not for stress, but it helps with my arthritis. It helps my hands, and it, it's, it's good. But a lot of people call this a stress ball. 
Is it stressful? I mean, I'm stressed out. I grip my teeth. I'm stressed out. I'm squeezing this. Is it going to help? I don't know. I don't think it may relieve stress physically. It may relieve stress in a context of taking your mind off what you're dealing with. But the only thing for the believer that's actually going to make a difference is to understand that the immortal, invisible God came in the earth, to the earth in the flesh and dwelled among us, and he has saved us, and we have seen the fullness of all that God ever has been eternally in the face of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, we have nothing to fear. Jesus says, do not be anxious about anything. So let's go to the next question. Do not be anxious about anything. This one. Fear and stress and depression, don't be anxious. Anxiety is it, it, it eats us up. And we look at different generations. I see younger generations as they're coming up. They think they're supposed to live in a stress-free environment. They think they're supposed to be without anxiety. But, beloved, you got to understand something. Anxiety is absolutely part of, of, of dealing with life. Anxiety is what grows us. Anxiety is what strengthens our faith. First Peter chapter 1, the, that you will be trialed with various trials if necessary that produce the outcome of what? Your faith. To the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls as we look to the unseen, not to that which is seen. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's been crushed and perplexed and driven to despair, or not. He's been broken and all this kind of, but he's not been driven to despair. He's not been destroyed, but he's always given up his, in this body, being given over to death. And he says, but I look to the things that are unseen. Because these light momentary afflictions prepare me for an eternal weight of glory. So how we deal with stress, how we deal with depression, and how we deal with anxiety is to continually focus on the promises of God. And the promises of God, now listen to this. I want you to take good note, beloved. The promises of God do not promise us a lack of stress, anxiety, or fear. The promises of God do not promise us that the circumstances are going to take away or be taken away to mitigate these things. We are promised persecution. We are promised suffering. We are promised anxieties. We are promised stressors, things that cause anxiety and things that cause stress. We are promised that there will always be opportunity for depression. The difference maker is to come through, to come to the table of grace, mercy, and the power of God versus the table of my sufficiency. As long as James is looking at himself and how he's supposed to deal with depression and how he's going to deal with overcoming all these feelings and all these thoughts, then I am forever going to be mired in the, in the, in the, in the bog of my own self-pity and my own fear and my own anxiety and my own depression. I have been in a deep, dark depression. Years and years ago, I was in a depression that I could not even fathom describing to some of you. But the only way to express it poetically is that it was death without dying. And the only thing that helped. The only thing that worked. There wasn't the loving hand. There wasn't the caring hug. There wasn't the card. There wasn't the the, the the on time word. It wasn't even in the context of me knowing people were praying for me. It was absolutely the word of God in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 where it talks about God in many ways spoke to our fathers through the, and the prophets uh, in many ways. But in these last days he speaks to us through his son through whom he created the world, through whom he redeemed his people. And when Jesus Christ was finished with his redemption, he sat down. And I said today in our, our teaching in 1 John 3 that the church needs to chill out and relax and rest in the finished work of Christ. Beloved, that is what God showed me. And it was a very difficult road. It was a very long road. But that was the power of God unto my joy and the same feelings the same stressors the same issues still always knocking on my door ringing my doorbell whispering in my ear telling me things that are lies but the truth of christ remains the truth of christ remains and it's also okay, beloved, to see a doctor about your depression. It's also okay, beloved, to talk to a professional in the context of, of counseling. And But understand that these are temporary fixes. They're not going to make a difference. They're not going to cure us of these things. What's going to cure us of these things is the glory of Christ and its promise to us. We will be glorified as he is glorified. We will absolutely, absolutely do everything. Uh, we will absolutely be everything that we've ever desired to be and more beyond what we could ever think of. 
depression is is not an easy thing. It is a reality. I'm going to tell you what it's not. It is a reality first for the believer. If we were if we're believers and we see the truth of this world for what it is through the lens of God's righteousness and it doesn't cause us some kind of depression, we haven't really taken a good look at it. But the cool thing is when we understand, and I say cool, I guess it dates me, but the, the, the amazing thing is, the glorious thing is, is that when we look at God's sovereignty, when we look at the world and everything in it through God's sovereignty, when we look at God calls this for my good, it changes something. It's like it rewires our mind. And it's not, we are not depressed because we haven't figured out what God wants from us. We're not depressed because we haven't done the right thing. Now, of course, if we're living in rebellion, of course we're going to feel guilt and shame. Of course we're going to feel unworthy. Of, co- of course we're going to be broken. But there are times when, I mean, I would say most of the time that's not the case. And yes, there are times when Christians get mentally ill. And I'm saying that very kindly. I mean, I believe that in the moment of my depression, it was a true mental illness. I believe it was a clinical situation. But guess what? I was told that this couldn't happen for a Christian. I was told that if it did happen, it was something wrong with my faith. And so I decided I would not get help. And God was merciful to bring me through that without help. But it's not always the case. And then afterward, in the... After I felt great and saw things clearly and understood the purposes of suffering as I was supposed to, then I became anxious again. And then I started having the same feelings. And I thought, oh, no, I'm feeling the same thing. What's going to happen to me? Maybe I'm going to fall into depression again, but I wasn't. So what did I do? I went and talked to somebody. I went and talked to a brother in the Lord who was also a counselor, who was an expert in the way people think. And you know what he told me? He says, you are doing exactly what you should do. You understand the root of your hope. You understand what's going on. You understand you're not going to escape these things. And you need to listen to those warning lights and ask yourself, are you listening to a lie or are you standing in the truth? And beloved, those little things, and of course, those are (laughs) anecdotal, okay? It doesn't mean that that's your answer, but Christ is your answer. And I am here to discuss those things as we are able to. Um, And and, and I believe that, that in the end, I am better off than trying to battle all these things by myself. So let's let's look then about this. Am I trusting God? Is it contradictory for me to live or have anxiety and fear? Um, how can I trust God if I'm so anxious? Well, how can you trust God if you're not anxious? I'm, I'm serious. How can you trust God if you're not anxious? I mean, if you have no anxiety, where, where, where's the need for faith? If you have no fear, where's the need for believing in Christ? If you have no worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, where is the resolve to rest in the promises of God? That's not there. If we're just going through life and just in a, in a happy coma, everything's great. We're not growing in our faith. We're not seeing the hand of God work. And look at the narrative of Scripture. Name one person who had the easy-peasy life with no stress. They just lived with the Lord Jesus and walked with the Lord Jesus and everything was great and all was good. And they just, uh, the only thing they wrote was a smiley face at the end. None, none of the people. There's not one narrative. There's not one person on the walls of this study that in, the, in, these, in these pages behind me that have ever been, that's ever been written about that has had an incredibly awesome, easy, happy-go-lucky life while being Christ by being a child of God. It just doesn't happen. And in these situations, we are able to seek help, seek prayer, have other people help us, which is a way of ministry to others. We are also able to learn that Christ suffered. Christ had anxiety. Christ had fear. Yet he resolved to believe and to hold fast to that which the Father had promised. We see the we see the the, the narratives and the examples of all the patriarchs and all the matriarchs and all the people of the, of the Scripture, all the people of history who have followed in the footsteps of, of the apostles and their martyrdom, and we see that God has never forsaken them. God forsaked Christ and crushed Him, and He will not forsake us. So it's not contradictory. It's necessary. Paul, Peter says it. You will be stressed and caused and be grieved by various kinds of trials if necessary. Because when you are, this produces the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Because you, in the midst of the most absurd 
I mean, the, the most terrible persecution, Peter says. You have the most absurd answer. Praise be to God. I have joy that's often inexpressible. Don't gauge your hope by your happiness, beloved. Gauge your hope by the true and faithful one who is Jesus Christ. I have much more to say, but I've, I've just about run out of time on these questions. Young girl in Vietnam asked this question. Are we supposed to choose between mercy and justice? And in that context there, I have, <clears throat> in, the, in, in the sense, are we supposed to pit these two to get, uh, against each other, I guess? Mercy and justice. And justice says this on a legal standpoint. This is the law. You've broken the law. This is the consequence. Exercise justice. Justice is good. Justice is righteous. Justice is is legal. Justice is what we want to see. We want to see people be brought to justice, right? But where does mercy meet justice? In our human world, we don't get to pick. We we do have to pick between mercy and justice to a great degree. I can't be merciful, and to a certain point. Because if I'm merciful too much, then I am unjust. For example, if someone has killed someone in murder, kidnapped a child, attacked someone physically, and I say to them in mercy, you know, it's okay. That person's gone now. Just go free. It's okay. We fix their bruises. Just go free. No, 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 no. That's wrong. That's evil. So we can't be merciful. So there's a time when mercy can overcome justice. All right. Now, when we look at it in a spiritual sense, so we have to be careful. We can't have merciful judges, but we can be merciful in the sentencing. For example, if the, if, the, if the law says the wage of this particular crime is this to this, then the judge can say, I'm going to be lenient, and that's a type of mercy. I'm, going to be, I'm, going to, I'm not going to give you a 25-year sentence. I'm going to give you a 10-year sentence. I have the ability to do that under the law, so that mercy is still just. Okay, so mercy must always be just. It's not pitted against the other. Now here it comes in a spiritual sense. God cannot say, I'll just make you sit in a spiritual prison for 200 years, and then you'll have eternal life. No, if you fail in one, you are guilty of breaking all the law of God. If you are a sinner by birth, then you are guilty before God the Father. And there is nothing that can happen in the context of justice that can get you off the hook. That is why justice had to be served on Christ. Justice had to be given to Christ, who was perfect and righteous because if justice is poured out then justice is satisfied that's what it means justice is satisfied so then now the complete forgiveness of the sinner the sinner getting away with it all scot-free is justice because justice has been poured out on the innocents the innocent stood in the place of the guilty the guilty penalty has been paid the guilty is free to go and that's the good news, see. <clears throat> the good news doesn't start with the law and God's wrath. The good news starts and ends with the law is satisfied in God's justice against Jesus Christ. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. I could go on and on and on in this philosophical discussion here within, the, within my theological things. What about capital punishment? Is it biblical? Yes. And many times throughout Scripture, we see the narrative of how God had created nations. He even used pagan nations, his own enemy, to bring discipline and punishment to his own people. Uh, he said many times through the prophets of the Old Testament, we see God speak. He says, I'm going to send these people to be my rod of correction for you. Uh, Paul talks about the government bearing the sword, and he does not bear the sword in vain. Now, Paul is not talking about the context of you don't fear the government if you do right. He's not talking about tyrannical governments that hate right stuff. Okay, um, though we are, they are still established by God. That's a whole other conversation. The deal with the fact to deal with the fact that God established government to execute justice. If a crime is worthy of death, then it is good and just to take the life of others. But here is my thought on that as a believer. I believe that if there is a crime that is a capital crime, and if that sentence is laid down, it cannot be argumentative evidence. It cannot be, it, it must be forensic. It must be absolute evidence. And the evidentiary process of that type of 
that type of thing must be ironclad without one one millionth of a shadow of a doubt. So in that, I believe capital punishment is justified biblically. However, that is given to the governing authorities. It is not given to James Tippins. It is not given to the guy across the street. We cannot enact justice in a capital sense. We can defend ourselves, but we cannot be vigilantes. And I know that hurts a lot of our feelings, but we can't do that. We can't be vigilantes in a physical way. We can't be vigilantes in a spiritual way. We can't be vigilantes in a relational way or in any other way. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So in that context, and then based on the this question here from just a minute ago, um, God is the true justice giver. So even when we exercise a temporary justice in the context of our legal system here, which is also representative of God's justice and his law, um, it's still not justice until God does what he's going to do. And I'm convinced that there are sometimes people who are incarcerated in this, in this life, but who are free in the next. Because God brings them to faith. They are his elect. And though they may be paying the penalty of incarceration, they may not be free. They may be, they may be, holding, uh, the, they may be in the holding of the justice of the world. They will not receive the justice of God because they have been given Christ. They've been given to Christ who's, in whom God has fulfilled his justice. Are we stewards of suffering in this life? And what does this say about us when we complain in suffering? Now, this is my question. I asked this question of myself just this past week in a conversation with a brother, and I started thinking about it in this way, and I thought to myself, okay, this, this is, is important. If all that comes to my life, all, everything, and I'm telling you right now, I could write a book on bad things. <laughs> I could write an autobiography of bad stuff. Um, and I could write an autobiography of good stuff. I mean, I could write a big book of good things. But what do we tend to look at? We tend to look at the bad things. I mean, I, I mean, yes, we always do like to post interesting stuff going on in the world, um, uh, in our lives. Look at my new cat. Look at my new car. Look at my grandkids. I mean, this is this is the point of social media, so we could experience life together and see all the good things. And sometimes weep with those who weep, and and cry with those who cry, and you know feel sympathy for those who need it, and we rejoice when we need it. So it, it all comes together. We can't pick. But by nature, I think human beings love the negative. I mean, I, I see the news sometimes when I turn it on, and I don't watch the news every day, maybe once a week, every two weeks probably. And um, I see the report after the report after report after report of, you know, so-and-so did this, so-and-so burglarized that, so-and-so raped this person, so-and-so shot this person, there's this riot over here, there's this cop doing this over here. And I'm not saying that I should shield myself from that, but you know good and well that all there was a lot of good stuff going on. I mean, you only hear about the people who get out of prison when they recommit a crime. And recidivism is in view. Uh, here's John. He went to prison for 10 years. He's been out for two months, and he's already burglarized another store. See, the way these people are always right. We don't hear about the hundreds of people who got out and said, I'm never going to do another crime in my life. As a matter of fact, I'm going to start a, a, a company where I can help people learn how to overcome thievery or what. I mean, we don't see those things because they don't sell. They don't sell ads. They don't get viewership. We don't go to the newspaper to look at all the the, the cool stuff that's going on in the social section, if your newspaper still has that, we go to the blotter and see who's been locked up. That's what we do. We like to watch America's dumb criminals, not America's, re, not America's productive um, incarcerated success stories. Um, we just we don't see that as a whole. So we need to recognize that the good stuff in my life and the bad stuff in my life are in the sovereignty of God, and he's done it all for my good and for his namesake so that when I rejoice in the good times and then I complain in the bads, what I'm really doing is I'm complaining about the gift of God for me because we already learned tonight that the suffering that I have in my life is the greatest opportunity for me to grow in the knowledge of understanding how sovereign God is and most importantly to see his power at work in me and my weakness, he is strong. When I'm strong, I don't need God. See, that's what our flesh says. And you don't believe that? Then ask yourself the last time you actually had everything going well that you were laboring in prayer. We don't, we don't labor in prayer where everything's going well. We're, <clears throat> we're typically just going about our day enjoying the blessing of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when things get rough, we're like, oh, no. <laughs> now I've got I've to deal with this. Beloved, we should rejoice in our suffering for that moment. We can be honest about it. We can even say, I'm going to complain 
And we can complain to our brothers and sisters, but we shouldn't complain to the world. We can complain to our brothers and sisters about how we feel, about what we're experiencing. We can complain to our brothers and sisters that we need prayer, but then our brothers and sisters should encourage us to rejoice in the midst of our suffering. They should encourage us to look to that which is unseen. They should encourage us to recognize God's hand in it and to know that, I hate to even use this because it's so cliche, but this will pass, but what if it doesn't? God hasn't promised that anything will pass except that everything in the world, including our suffering, will pass away. And one day we get out of all. We get to be like Christ. We get to be glorified and forever unchangeable. Never t- Imagine sitting at your desk right now or looking at your phone, listening to this broadcast, without any fleshliness, any depravity, any sinfulness whatsoever in any way invading your thoughts. I don't know what that would be like. But I can promise you that I can make a list of everything that wouldn't be in my head. And I can make a list of everything that I wouldn't be anxious about. And I can make a list of everything that, that, that I would no longer have to worry and fear and be depressed over. But the cool thing is, is in that day, I won't even care about that list anymore because it will all be buried. Because it died with Christ and I'm alive. And you're alive if you were in Christ. So in that context, we all have everything. Back to the issue of justice. Do we have nearsightedness and justice in our culture? In other words, are we unable to see how we or our own guilt stand before God in comparison to those who sin against us? Okay, I think I understand what this question is asking. And um, I feel like I had a conversation about this with someone a couple of weeks ago as well in the context of this. Sometimes we cry for specific issues of justice. We see the idea of justice, justice, justice. I think what this question is asking is are we nearsighted? Are we unable to see? We see all this injustice here, and then we go, get them, God, get them, God, get them, God. Deal with this, Lord. But we forget that we, too, are what? Are sinners. There's two things to think about here. In In a literal sense, yes, we are guilty. Okay, my sin and the sin of these people who are doing injustices in the world are identical in the economy of God's righteousness. But not everybody has had their sin put on the person of Christ. Christ did not die in the place of every human being. Christ died for his elect. And in these things, we need to recognize, yes, we are just as guilty. We are just as sinful. But Christ has taken our place. So let us not forget that. That's the important thing. My head's going a thousand directions, and I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to... So yes, we do forget that. Secondly, we cry out sometimes for justice thinking God's not doing it, and God is doing it. God is going to bring recompense. He is stacking up vengeance, and he will pour it out in due time. And yes, and in, in, as citizens of this country, of, of the United States, not all of you are in the United States, but as citizens of the country of the United States, we have uh, laws and governing things that, that take... That, that, that give us the right to demand justice in some context. So we have things that other countries don't have. They can't demand certain things. Some people are under monarchs and some people are under maniacs. And so we have a different thing. We are kings. We control and run everything. And there are millions of kings and a small amount of, of, of servants who we call government. <laughs> the government is the servants. So we can demand justice, but how do we do that according to the law? And... Um, I think sometimes when we get all fired up about those things and we think we're going to affect change, we're actually trying to be like God in some sense to think that we've got some number one ability to affect change in a, in a real way against all the atrocities of the world. And number two, the authority. Uh, we can exercise the ability and authority that we have, but ultimately as believers, we can only do so much before we then usurp the very thing that God has promised, and that is that he will avenge us. He will avenge himself, you see. Because here's another thing to think about. If right now, as I'm on this broadcast, someone breaks into my home and destroys it and takes the life of everyone in it, including me, it's not really unjust. It really isn't. It's part of God's ultimate plan to bring about his purposes. And more importantly, as a believer, if you want to kill me, I'm ready. I'm ready. Because this is not what I live for. I live for Christ, and then together we live for Christ for one another. This world, it's going away. 
just that mindset changes everything about how we think and look and interact in the world. doesn't mean we become pacifists. It doesn't mean we don't stand up. It doesn't mean we don't, but let's hold it loosely. Let's take everything God's given us and let's hold it loosely. Let's just let it sit in our hands so when the wind of the Spirit blows, it can blow it right away if he so sees fit. Something to think about. What is the mind of Christ and how do we have it already? Well, I actually mentioned this. I saw this question come in this morning and I mentioned it in some sense in my preaching today. But the mind of Christ is, as Paul would say in Philippians, that Christ who was equal with God did not take equality with God something to be grasped. And he didn't make much of himself as God. But he became a servant, a slave, obedient unto death on a cross. Have this mind among you. So in other words, we should consider others more important than ourselves. Jesus is God, and yet he considered his elect sheep greater than himself. And he subjected himself to the punishment of the Father and the wrath and the vengeance of God the Father so that he would satisfy his wrath on our behalf. That's the mind of Christ. So that when we do what we do, and we have it already, we have the Spirit of God within us, we have the knowledge of Christ, we have the truth, and in all of this, we need to to take to keep our mind focused on the person of Jesus Christ and how he thought and how he lived and how he spoke and how he taught. That's why I am constantly talking until I turn blue in the face that we need to be about the Bible. We need to read the Scripture. Please read the Scripture because in the, therein you will find the mind of Christ revealed. And we have this mind. It's hard. It's a battle. But together, by the power of Christ, we will walk in that way. So that's the answer to that. How should we see, I'll put this question in backwards. How should we see our good works today? Are they a type of righteousness or a shadow of righteousness? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, We know that righteousness that we are the righteousness that we have is not ours. It is another's. We stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are imputed to the account of, to our account of the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that when we pray, when we worship, when we serve, when we love, when we forgive, when we speak well, when we do good deeds, God sees them as if his son has done them perfectly. They don't count for anything meritoriously, but they count to his glory. So, when we do them, they are not complete, but we are complete in our righteousness. We are not yet sinless, but we will be. And so, in that sense, it is a type of righteousness that we imitate Christ and do that which he teaches us to do because of our love for him, not because of our fear of him. And then when we do these things, we recognize that these are just shadows of what we will be. Imagine serving someone, just a glass of water with no sin. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that's like. I can't imagine. And I've philosophized about this in my mind many, many times over through the, throughout my entire life. What would it be like to literally love someone in my inner being without sin in my life, without sin in my flesh, without a sinfulness of my mind that I don't even reckon, I don't even see it. See, I'm not saying that I'm sinfully doing these things and I've got ulterior motives. I'm I'm just saying in the purest part of any express good work that I can muster or that you can muster, there is some taint to that. There is some spot on that. But by faith in Christ, it is perfect and acceptable to God and it is something that we ought to strive to do, but it is a shadow. It is not the true yet. One day that which is credited to us will be ours forever, and we will be without sin. It will be taken from us, and we will be made new perfectly. I can't wait to that. I cannot wait for that day. Well, beloved, that's all the time I have. I have literally have seven more questions. Please post your questions. I, I, I think I tried to catch all the questions that came in during the discussion. I love you all, and I'm so glad that you spend this time with us each um, each week. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really honored, honestly. So with that, good night, and I will see you all Wednesday. I promise I am preaching Hebrews 11, 7, 10 Eastern Time Wednesday night. See you then.